Welcome to Move Your Mind. My name is Nick Brax, and this is a podcast where we have real conversations with real people and give real advice. We've been conditioned to believe that strength is all about suppressing emotions, staying stoic, and never showing vulnerability. But what if we challenge that belief and offer a new perspective, giving people, especially men, permission to feel? Emotion plays a significant role in how we connect with others, how we lead, and how we make choices. We live in a society that sometimes overemphasizes certain traits based on gender, but true strength, as brilliantly put by Dr. Brene Brown, is the perfect combination of tough and tender. It's about being courageous enough to embrace vulnerability and connect with our emotions. That's what makes us truly powerful. The following was derived from a TED talk delivered by my next guest, Mike Cameron delivering his powerful message on giving people, especially men, permission to feel. With over two decades of studying the impact of emotions on human behavior, he's a business leader and a sales professional who knows how crucial it is to connect with our feelings. Mike's journey led him to study the works of experts like Dr. Antonio Damasi, Dr. Travis Bradbury, Dan Gorman, and the renowned Dr. Brene Brown, just to name a few. He learned that emotions play a vital role in how we make decisions and connect with one another, both personally and professionally. But Mike's journey took a tragic turn when he faced the unimaginable loss of his girlfriend, Colleen. In the face of such adversity, he discovered that true strength lies not in suppressing emotions, but in embracing vulnerability and learning from our feelings. Mike urges us to redefine what it means to be a badass, to dismantle the outdated stereotypes, and give ourselves permission to feel and be courageous enough to face emotions head on. Mike, great to see you again, mate. I'm so happy that we've been able to make the time to have this conversation. Yeah, it's good to see you, man. I'm, I'm happy that we made this happen. No, same here. And we had a great chat the first time. And yeah, it's, it's you know, you've got a super interesting story. You're doing really cool things. And yeah, love having these opportunities to just sit here and, and talk, get to know each other. Uh, have other people hopefully learn something from it and and uh yeah hear more about your story that that's the hope and i i think the the important part as you said is is having the conversations it is exactly just having these conversations talking openly about things and yeah it's so interesting from these interviews like you just week by week uh you know i'll hear people reaching out and you just never know who it's going to help or affect and so many of them, you just hear back from people and you you forget some sometimes that people are actually listening to these conversations. Yes. And, um, you know, it's such a rewarding thing when you hear that, oh, it's actually, they've taken something out of this, they've gone and, you know, gotten help or whatever it was, you know, whatever it led to, it led to yeah. taking action in something. So it is a, you know, a, a great thing to be able to do. Mm-hmm. So before we get into it, yeah, would you be able to give a background on yourself and your story and basically how you came to I mean I know it's a quite a big story but um yeah bit of a bit of that background and and how you ended up doing what you're now doing yeah absolutely I am I'm happy to 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 go there and and share that story so I I've been a business guy uh sales and leadership guy for 30 some odd years and uh been successful in business um and, and, you know, it was interesting back in, in 2015, um, my, my world was shaken up in a, in a substantial way. I was dating a woman, uh, my girlfriend, um, I'd been separated for three years and, uh, met a wonderful woman and, yeah, again, sitting here now thinking about seven years ago, would I have thought that I'd be having this kind of conversation and not in a million years, but, you know, life has a way of throwing these curveballs at us and we have to deal with them. So it was, you know, October 2nd of 2015 my girlfriend Colleen had spent the night and uh, she was a yoga instructor. She's an artist, a, a potter, a painter, a videographer. Um, 
And so that Friday morning, she woke up at 5 a.m., had to go teach yoga at 6. And uh, I remember the alarm going off. She got up, came around to my side of the bed, gave me a kiss, said goodbye. I said, hey, have fun at yoga. And I rolled over and went back to sleep. I woke up around 7 o'clock. And as was our custom, I shot her a text and I said, hey, how was yoga? To which I got no response. And I, and I thought, you know, nothing out of character. She wasn't a huge talker, but was an incredible listener. And as such, often got caught into these long drawn out conversations with students. So I carried on about my morning, had my breakfast, hopped in the car. I had a meeting downtown at nine o'clock and I sent her another note, no response. I phoned as I was driving downtown and the phone rang and rang and rang and eventually went to voicemail. And then, you know, your mind starts playing these games. And I thought, Okay, is like this is feeling a little out of character. It, is she mad at me? Did I do something wrong? You, you know, all these stories that start spinning through your head. Is she reconciling with her ex husband? Again, just all this stupid, ridiculous stuff and thinking, no, no, we had a fabulous night last night. Um, no, this is, this is all just garbage. And so I, I finished my meeting downtown, uh, came out at 10 o'clock, still no response sent her another note, headed back to my office. I had an 11 o'clock appointment and went into that one. And by this time, you know, I've got that feeling in the pit of my stomach, like something's not right here. This is just really out of character. And I finished up my meeting and the, the folks that I'd met with, we agreed we were going to go across the street for lunch. And again, at this point, like my head was not there at all my gut was telling me something was wrong. My head was trying to tell me that, you know, you're making things up. We walked across the street to go to the restaurant. And as we walked in the door to the restaurant, my phone rang and uh, I looked at it and it was a blocked number. And so I answered the phone and uh, the voice on the other end of the line said, uh, is this Mike Cameron? And I said, yes. And he said, this is constable so-and-so. And my, my heart just sank. And I said, is she okay? And he says, where are you? And I practically screamed into the phone. I'm sure everybody in the restaurant was looking at me. I said, is she okay? He says, look, where are you? We're at your house. We're coming to you. And so I told him where I was and I turned and I walked out of the restaurant. I don't think I said two words to my guests. And, you know, I stood at the side of the road waiting for what seemed like an eternity, but was probably five or six minutes. My house mm -hmm. wasn't very far away from, from where I was. And this unmarked police car pulls up across the street and, and I start walking across towards them. And he met me in the, the middle of the, the street. And after identifying who I was, he just, he looked me in the eye and he said three words that would change my life. He simply said, Colleen is dead. She was shot and killed by an ex-boyfriend who subsequently took his own life. And yeah, again, for me at that point, you know, I was running a successful business. Life was great. Things were good. We were, we were doing fantastic. This was, you know, this was the woman of my dreams. My, my life had changed and in a heartbeat, it was it was done it was gone it was over and uh, just you know again trying to wrap my head around what had happened was incredibly challenging i mean i remember sitting there in the back of that police car once they they took me in and, and at that point i did not know what had happened all i knew was she was was dead and uh, i remember sitting there the mantra in my head just this can't be real. This can't be mm -hmm. real. This cannot be real. And, you know, them pepper me with questions and me trying to respond without, you know, I kept getting angry because they wouldn't tell me anything. Like I said, all I knew was that she was gone. They didn't tell me what had happened. They didn't tell me like, are the kids okay? What about my kids? Are we in danger? What's going on? Um, yeah, it was just, it was surreal. So, so that was, you know, the big pivotal moment in my life. And, and we all have them, right? Like we've, we've all globally been, been thrust into, into this pandemic in the last three years. 
where we've been forced to pivot. And, you know, this was sort of my big pivotal moment and how it brought me to the work that I do now with, with men and mental health. You know, I, I had lots of folks at the time that wanted me to go after the justice system, which had certainly let her down. You know, um, she'd filed a restraining order, had done all the right things, reported all the breaches. Um, but I just thought, you know, Nick, like, how do we build a better restraining order is probably the wrong question. And, you know, maybe the better question is, how do we prevent men from getting to that point in the first mm -hmm. place? And that's, that's what became my focus. Which is, yeah, really, you know, brave path to take, because I'm sure, you know, many people and the natural instinct would be just to go and, like you're saying, try and fight the justice system, stay, you know, be angry, stay in that state. And in that victim mindset, which I don't know how you reconcile that thing. I think no one probably knows what it would be like to go through something like that other than yourself and anyone who's been through that kind of thing. It's just such a, such a full on thing to go through, but to be able to really, you know, see it that way and use it as a way to, you know, change your own life and find new meaning to help other people and prevent this thing. It's, you know, such a noble thing to do and, yeah. Thank you for sharing yeah, it. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's interesting because, you know, that's often the response that, that it's brave, that it's noble. For me, it was survival, man. Like mm -hmm. it was, mm -hmm. this is what I needed to do in order to turn pain into purpose, give some meaning mm -hmm. to what had happened. You know, I, again, I, I couldn't change what had happened, but I had options as to, how I responded. And, and, you know, to your point, I mean, I could have dove into a bottle. I could have dove back into my work. I was already a very accomplished workaholic. Uh, I, I could have gone down that road, but I yeah. just, when I looked at what skill sets do I have, how can I take this and make this mean something and, and not have her life be taken for nothing. Um, and you know, again, part of this was the exploration that, that her and I had done together. You know, she was a, a yogi and, and really had a way of finding the beauty in everything, just that practice of presence and, and being open to everything that, that life brought her, um, really opened my eyes to a different world. So I, I thought, you know who am I to squander this opportunity that she had given me? Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things when I look back and reflect in my career, one of the things I learned early in my career is the impact that emotion has on human behavior. You know, as a sales guy, when I was 18, I started working in a garden supply, a wholesale company. And I, I literally bagged shit for a living. I uh, bagged steer manure that, that they used to, to fertilize flower gardens. And eventually I worked my way up in the organization and I started selling garden supplies. And what I realized at that point is nobody buys a bag of steer manure because they want to own a bag of shit. <laughs> they buy that steer manure because they want that feeling that they're going to get when they grow that beautiful vegetable garden or that beautiful rose bush or what have you. And again, that was kind of my first introduction to this whole concept that we don't buy the thing, we buy the feeling the thing is going to give us. And as my career progressed, and I ended up moving into finance, um, I started researching that a lot more. And I found a fellow by the name of Dr. Antonio Damasio. He talks about emotion is the edifice upon which reason is built. In other words, not only do we buy based on emotions, but as human beings, we make decisions based on emotion. And, you know, in my story, this was a man that made a decision with very permanent consequences based on a very temporary emotion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so again, she had given me the gift of feeling so deeply that again, who am, who am I to throw that away? Who am I to squander that? Who am I, who am I to numb that feeling? Even as painful as it was, 
with booze, with work, with drugs, with whatever. Um, so I really just leaned into that and got curious about it. And, you know, the big game changer for me out of a friend of mine from Montreal. So like thousands of miles away from me, he sent me, um, Ram Dass's letter to Rachel and, and Ram Dass for your audience, if they don't know, was an American spiritual leader from the seventies. He wrote the book, be here now. And Rachel was a young girl who had been brutally murdered. Ram Dass wrote this letter to her parents. And I would highly recommend everybody just Google Ram Dass letter to Rachel. It's maybe five paragraphs, but I got to tell you, Nick, that letter changed my life. And there, there were three sort of key components out of that. The first thing he said is anyone strong enough to remain conscious through such teachings as you're receiving, probably very few. And when I read that, I, I knew that I needed to remain conscious through the teachings that this experience was giving me. And the second piece he talked about, he said, our rational minds will never understand, but our hearts, if we keep them open, will find their own intuitive way. And again, I can't tell you how many times I asked that question. Why, 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 why her? Why now? Why, 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 why would anybody do this? And, and, and there's yeah. just no rational answer to that. But our hearts, if we keep them open, will find their own intuitive way. And then the last piece of that letter that he talked about, that probably the most powerful for me, and especially in the context of masculinity and men, he said, now is the time to let your grief find expression, no false strength. Mm. And I think for so many men in particular, we put up this false front, this bravado, this false strength. We think that being strong means that we bury, avoid, suppress our feelings. But the reality is true strength is about having the courage to sit with those feelings, experience them in depth and learn from them what we can. So for me, that was the healing journey. And then, you know, again, teaching other men to do the same thing has been powerful medicine for me. There's such powerful messages that you're saying there. And it's so true. And it's, it's confronting and really difficult and we feel like that you know the answer is just more to push things down and push on and that means we're stronger but it's really not and it leads to addictive behaviors and a whole range of different behavior patterns but yeah super powerful and yeah again thank you for just being so open with all of this and sharing this story because it's you know obviously such a confronting thing but i think so many people i'm, I'm sure through your work people you've influenced so many people already and i know you know by hearing this for me and for other people it really is something that um will help so many so it's yeah it's so important that we do talk about these things so how um how how long was that process for you to work through and you know find yourself you know finally in a place where you were sort of semi functional again or you know on the new path you've been on how you know that must have just been um, such a confusing time. You know what? I mean, that's a great question. And, and I think the answer is there is no time. I mean, it's mm. been what, seven and a half years now. Um, actually, no, I guess, yeah, seven and a half years. Um, and, and there are still moments like grief isn't linear. It's not something you move through. It's something you carry with. Yes. And, you know, I think what was powerful for me was recognizing that very early in the process. You know, there were moments where, again, I'd be furious, I'd be angry, and I would be driving down the road, and I remember starting to, like, fucking beat my hands against the steering wheel and just shaking with rage as I was driving. And, you know, that was that why question. Why, 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 why? And then there were other times where, you know, I remember curled up into a ball, crying my eyes out on the kitchen floor. And, you know, I just let all of those come and I got curious with them. And that, that was the, you know, 
is anyone strong enough to remain conscious through these teachings as you are receiving that kind of kept running through my head. And, you know, as I was laying there on the, on the floor sobbing, rather than giving myself the typical, come on, man, suck it up. Let's go. You got this. Let's get over this. I just got curious about what is that feeling? Where is that coming from? What's coming up? What does that feel like physically? Mm -hmm. What does that feel like in my heart? What can I notice about this? And the more curious I got about the experience, the easier it became to deal with. And again, just giving myself permission to have those feelings. I mean, yeah, we talk about men and mental health. I mean, men everywhere are fucking literally dying for somebody to give them permission to feel. Yep. You know, we talk about suicide rates they are three times more likely men are three times more likely to die by suicide than than our female counterparts. And that, in my opinion, is a large part of it. You know, so this is why I'm passionate about teaching men the art of emotional reconnection. And, and that and that's because emotionally connected men don't fucking kill people. Emotionally connected men don't take their own lives. Emotionally connected men make better partners. They make better fathers. They make better leaders. They make better human beings. And in fact, they live richer lives. And, and, you know, the analogy I use by staying present with all of these emotions, it's changed my life from black and white mm -hmm. to living in 4K color. And one of the first times that that was really evident for me was maybe a year and a half after Colleen had been murdered I went to a concert and it was a, a couple that they do a lot of work in the um, uh, child sexual abuse space. He, the, the, one of the singers has a story of his own. Um, but I remember being at that concert and it was just so beautiful and just tears welling up. And I don't know the depth of emotion that I got to experience watching a show. Mm. Like it was not something I would have had three years ago. You know, not that you need to go to a concert and ball your eyes out every time, but, it, and it, it wasn't even a sad thing for me at that time. It was just a awe thing and a beauty thing. And again, it just, it's for me, it's the difference between living in black and white and 4k color. I love that way of putting it. And it, you know, it's, it, I guess in, unless we, like you are saying mm -hmm. there, <clears throat> open ourselves up to it, stop holding on to things, stop trying to control everything, uh, you know, allow ourselves to be more vulnerable. We can't access all of those emotions. We can't say, as you're saying in, in that 4K, everything is going to be more black and white. Uh, and I, I guess that would be, you know, from what you're saying, I think, um, that extreme situation that you went through, it sounds like those by product of, the only way to get through it is to become more open and realize that, you know, things aren't black and white and that things are going to be good and bad and going to change and be living in that state, which in fact is probably the only state that any of us um, are going to feel truly happy by living in, living in because where, you know, society's taught us and especially men to look at the world in this you know, very one dimensional way that if I just do this and achieve this and acquire this and, you know, do all these things, then I'll be okay. And I've got to just stick to that formula. And it just, life doesn't work like that. Life's going to be in, in even in a given day, there's going to be ups and downs and things are going to change. And there's going to be opportunities to, you know, feel things, there's going to be sad things. And they're all just as important as the other and they need to be embraced. But, um, you know, I guess like they're some of the lessons that, you know, you've learned through that extreme circumstance, but the rest of us need to find a way to, um, in our own ways to incorporate into our daily lives. Yeah. Well, and, and it is, it's a practice, you know, and I talk about that a lot. It's, it's that preparing in the calm for the coming of the storm. So when you asked earlier about, you know, how do, how do I move through that, you know, and part of that for me is because I had been practicing prior to that. Yes. So, you know, the perfect example is, is somebody cuts you off in traffic. 
And, you, you, you know, the inclination for me was to get pissed off, to honk the horn, to speed ahead, cut them off. But just recognizing when that emotion comes up and saying, OK, there it is, noticing it. And then for me, one of the most powerful questions, and this was another friend of mine gave me this one. He said, he says, what would, what would the man I want to be do in this situation? So I can assure you the man I want to be isn't going to flip them the bird, isn't going to, you know, go at speed ahead and cut them off again. The man I want to be is going to have kindness, compassion, and empathy and say, ah, oh, that's too bad. That guy must be having a really shitty day for him to be driving like an asshole. Um, yes. And so practicing in those low consequence, you know, or, or a long line at the supermarket can be frustrating. I got to get home. I got to cook dinner for the kids. Noticing that frustration and just practicing Okay, how do you how do you respond to that? Well, I'm grateful that we have a grocery store close by home. I'm grateful that my kids will be there when I get home. I'm grateful that I can actually make dinner that I can afford to put groceries, you know, food on the table. Right. So again, low yeah. consequence, but starting to have those practices and the presence of mind to do that in those moments, so that when life does throw you those inevitable big moments it's not the first time you've ever had to deal with navigating your emotions thank you so much for supporting move your mind we're expanding the offerings of the organization and we're tailoring everything we do to suit you guys and to try and answer to all of your needs and the questions that you send in the book is available globally you can find all of the links at nickbrax.com slash book yeah yeah and I, I love that way you're putting it because it's really you know, giving like a lot of this stuff can feel so intangible. And I think that's probably one of the issues a lot of a lot of people face when, you know, trying to make change in this area or, or exploring it or, you know, it's like, where do I begin? How do I do it? You know, it's not like if I want to get fit or whatever, I, you know, physically, I'll just go to the gym, I'll lift yes. weights or whatever, put on, there's like very practical things but these, I think if we can give people more tangible things and ways to look at it, just like you said there, it makes it very clear and it's, you know, it's, it's um, also letting people know that it won't be easy to change these things. It's going to take a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of energy, a lot of, effort, a lot, a lot sure. of consolidated effort to not react. And, you know, I've noticed that so many times in my life when you're trying to undo behavior patterns and, every step of the way, every instinct inside of you is screaming at you to throw in the towel or, you know, take, you know, go this way or take this path when you know that it doesn't lead to the right, you know, um, outcome, but it's so hard to still go against that, even with that knowledge, because you're just, you're fighting so many urges, but the more practice, the more you, and then you see results and then you, you know, it's like anything. So I think people just really need a blueprint, don't they? Yeah, well, but I think your analogy of the physical fitness is perfect. And this is why I talk often about emotional fitness rather than mental health. Yeah. And especially for guys, because I think, you know, for guys, it's binary, right? When we think about mental health, it's either I'm mentally ill or I'm not. Yeah. You know, our vocabulary consists of six words. Are you good? Yeah, I'm good. And that's the extent of it. But if we equate that to physical fitness, we understand that if we want to get physically fit, it's going to take repetition and it's going to take time and it's going to take consistent movement forward and that it's a point in time measure. You know, there's been points in time in my life where I haven't been very physically fit. And there have been other points of time in my life where I've been incredibly physically fit and I know what I need to do to get there. And I also know that, you know, if I've been sitting on the couch for two years eating nothing but potato chips and I got an extra 50 pounds, it's going to take a little bit of time to burn that off. And to your point, it's the exact same thing with our emotional fitness. If you've lived, you know, for me, it was 42 years before I sort of started to wrap my head around some of this stuff. Uh, and it was it was sort of my first big one was my divorce. But if you have been 
metaphorically sitting on the couch eating potato chips for 42 years, you're not going to, that ain't going to fix overnight. It's going to take some concerted effort. So also giving yourself some grace to understand that this is a process. Let go of the result, commit to the process. A hundred percent. And that's another problem because we're in a society where we're taught to really just value all of these external things. So it's, you know, again, about, about work, about acquiring things, about money, whatever it is, you know, status, what, whatever our path is, it's all about these external things. And it's almost seen as if I put time and energy into this area and try and improve on the emotional fitness, that's going to take away from my time that I could put into trying to grow my company or try to, you know, whatever it is, get, get that job promotion, get to that next level when the, it is going to take effort. It's a different area of effort, but the long-term outcome will most likely be that the external career will, will excel. It'll go, it'll, you know, you'll get better results is, is the outcome. Oh, 100%. I mean, and, and that's a lot of, you know, I, I often sort of Trojan horse this stuff in. So I, you know, I ran a business, I, I founded, built, ran, and ultimately sold a business for 16 years. Um, and so I often get invited to come talk from the business community because I was successful in business. And so, of course, everybody wants to know about that. Yeah. But the reality is, it's that emotional fitness piece that allowed me to excel at business because Mm, business is mm. all about relationships. Yeah. It's all about relationship with yourself. It's all about relationship with others, which is all part and parcel. So, you know, I call myself a performance coach. So I'm a a professional speaker and a performance coach, but really it, it is about that introspection piece and getting solid on those, you know, what they would call soft skills because that is the difference between those that excel and those that don't. Um, so yeah, all of these, all of these emotional fitness components go hand in hand with excelling in business leadership, um, whatever, wherever else you want, you want to apply them. It makes so much sense because yeah, like you're saying, business is all understanding people dealing with people and yeah how are you going to understand other people and relationships if you don't understand yourself and your own relationship with yourself, it's going to make it very difficult. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, com- coming back to coming back to that, um, as human beings, we make decisions based on emotion. And if we don't understand those underlying emotions that drive the decisions that we and others make, we have zero chance of living a fully purposeful existence. So, that for me is where it all starts. You know, again, yeah. I, I believe that the emotional disconnection in men today is the number one threat facing humanity. Like you look at all of the sort of social ills of the world, um, you know, the mass shootings, the all of these things. I mean, these are emotionally disconnected men. Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to, in a second, ask you more about about that side of things and the work you're doing. But just before we go into that, um, a lot of our listeners are, you know, trying to start their own companies, entrepreneurial, that sort of area from, you know, you, like you said, you've built over 16 years, a very successful company, sold that company for anyone wanting to go on that journey and, you know, build their own venture. What would be some of the, you know, the core high level advice you would, you could give them to, if they were looking, what, what, what would you think would be some key values or key messages to take on board when you're trying to go on that long-term journey? I think, you know, especially younger and, and, you know, I tell the story often, um, my, my first inkling into, into finance, I was 23 years old. You know, I bought my first Porsche when I was 26. Um, And, you know, that just wasn't the answer. That wasn't really success. So I think really being able to identify what success means, what do you really want? And, you know, I talk about, I stopped setting goals 20 years ago, and instead I moved to a framework of values, intentions, and milestones. Because sometimes when we set goals, 
we focus on the wrong thing. You know, my goal when I was 23 was to make a hundred grand a year. Well, that wasn't really my goal. My goal was to create an environment where I could meet a partner, have a family. Like that was what was important to me. But I focused on that income goal. Mm -hmm. And as a result, so I met a woman, I had two beautiful kids, we had a house in the burbs. But I that income goal just kept going up and up and up and up. And as I chased it and chased it and chased it, you know, the relationship side went down and down and down until ultimately I ended up in a divorce. So I think rather than looking at I want to build a $10 million company and earn 300 grand a year or $5 million a year, you know, whatever it is, rather than looking at that as a goal, think about who do you want to be? What are your values? Again, it comes back to that mission, vision and values. And I know that gets kicked around an awful lot, but do that for yourself. So for example, for me right now, my mission is to empower a community of emotionally connected leaders that can aspire to help men feel more so they can be more and ultimately do more. Uh, and I've got a list of core values around that. I've got um, mantras that I use those with those values to make sure that I'm living those. So yeah, I think my biggest piece of advice would be to get clear on your values first, rather than focusing on the, the what I want. So it, it's, it's that be, do, have paradigm, right? And so many of us, especially for me when I was young, when I have this, then I can do that. So then I can become this versus, well, who do I need to be in order to do the things I need to do so I can have the life that I want? So focusing on that, who do I want to be first rather than the, what do I need to do to create the business or what do I want to have in the business? And once I have that, then I can be the person I want to be. And I, and I think that, you know, they talk about the three archetypes, the, the victim, the worker and the winner. So the victim says, when I have, then I'll do so I can be the worker says when I do, then I will have, so then I can be, and the winner, who do I need to be in order to do the things I need to do so that I can have the life that I want. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe not, here's this list of 10 things that you need to do to start your business, but really that is where it begins. I think that's, and then, yeah. Sorry. And, and then you've got that North star. So again, creating that, who do you want to be piece, getting those values in place, and not just listing off words. So, you know, one of my values is curiosity. So one of my mantra in that is curiosity over judgment. So that, you know, when I find myself getting judgmental, I just flip back to that. It's like, okay, whoa, 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 whoa. Curiosity, man. Mm. Like, why does Nick think like that? Why does Nick say that? Versus mm -hmm. going, why does Nick think that? Right? Like, it's just a different mindset. Uh, work ethic is another one of my core values. And my mantra there is just do the fucking work. Um, so again, when I find myself procrastinating or dawdling, that's the mantra I grab onto to make sure I'm living those values. So getting very clear on those values out of the gate, because then when you've got those decision points, those inflection points in your business, it's, you don't have to think about it. It's just like, does this align with my values? Yes or no. And usually it's fairly easy. It's not always, but usually it's fairly easy to identify that. And, you know, does this get me closer to or further away from, from my vision or mission? Uh, and if it's further away, then the answer is no. If it's closer to, then the answer is yes. And assuming it still aligns with my values. So, yeah, I, th I think that would be sort of the biggest thing is just get clear on the values, get clear on the mission and understand that that can change over time. We learn, we grow, we evolve. So reevaluate them. I think it's incredible advice and just in life, you know, that advice is so relevant because if you're just living and hoping that when you finally get to, you know, this certain point that you're then going to have permission to be the person you want to be, it just doesn't work. And, you know, you, a lot of people will start a company because, you know, I want to, I want to be a millionaire. Okay. Let's go look at the whole landscape as a blank canvas what 
where's the area that I can make the most money and what's the most trendy thing to do right now? Let's do that. And then you get six months into that and you're doing something that you're not aligned with and there's a new trend that's come up. So then you're probably going to jump onto that new one and then you're in a cycle of doing that. And then even if you do get lucky through that process and make all the money and achieve that, like you said, the bar's going to change and you're going to then need more to, to fuel it. And, you know, and a lot of the time it, it could be, I, and I've, you know, I've had these thoughts when I was younger and behaved like this. I've no people now who are doing it where it's, I need to make all this money so that then I can meet the partner and attract the right person. It's like, well, it'll probably work, but it probably won't be the right person because you'll probably make all of that money and then right. attract someone, but you, if you're attracting them through the money and through that lens of how you're trying to attract them. It's, I mean, maybe it will, but a lot of the time it's going to end up being quite a shallow relationship. And then you're going to realize later on that everything that all the important things are actually available to us right now. We don't need to achieve all these things. It's more for us to go on our own journey and you know what, like all the, all the things you said. So it's, um, yeah, it, it, I always say that it's so weird that, you know, life is so incredibly complicated, but also so simple in term in depending on which yes. way we look at it. Mm. Yeah. And it's so true. And it's funny, you know, I, I told you, I, I speak professionally and I remember probably 25 years ago, I was working for a company and we were at a, at the company, company retreat, a conference, and there was a keynote speaker on stage who was fantastic. I really enjoyed him. And I remember saying to my sales manager at the time that I am going to be one of the top producers here because when I am, then I can do that because my ultimate goal was to speak professionally. But I thought that I had to be a top producer first to give myself credibility. And, that, and you know, when I look back at that, like, dude, if you had just pursued that passion of mm. being a professional speaker at that time, how much further ahead would you have been? But I thought that I needed to, you know, be a top producer first, and then I could be the speaker on the, the thing. Anyways, it's, it's just... It's so true. Yeah, we get in our we get in our own way so often. It's so true, though. It's such a yeah. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? And that's happened. You know, I deal with that daily now. And you you know, you, there's just things where you have to keep reminding yourself, no, I can. There's no perfect time, and it's more just fear or uncertainty that's in the way. But uh, you know, we we can just t- take the steps now. We don't need permission. We don't need the perfect. Cir- set, well, there is never going to be that perfect set of circumstances to to go and do that, to take that step. So no, you're right. Like the, the biggest thing is to execute. Yeah. Whether you're right, whether you're wrong, whether you know what you're doing or you don't just freaking execute and the execution will give you feedback. If you fall flat on your face you get back up again and you do it again with a little bit of a tweak, Uh, but so, so many are paralyzed with fear or indecision. You know, a wrong decision is better than no decision. Exactly. Because a wrong decision, ironically, is actually sometimes better than a right decision because we learn, you know, we learn when we fall flat on our face. Yes, absolutely. So moving into what you're doing now, you're, you know, you've, you've moved out, you sold your company, you had this whole journey that you went through. Now you're working predominantly with men to empower men to help try and you know you were saying before which i agree it's one of the if not the biggest issues we face where um you know it's it's pretty compelling three times more men committing suicide i mean it's it's crazy that we're not doing more about this um what what are you actually doing what's the work you're doing can you you know explain you know the process of yes how that so works? again like i said i kind of trojan horse a lot of the stuff in so i still do a lot of sort of business consulting yep uh, performance coaching. I speak professionally on men's mental health. So I will get invited to different conferences to do, have those conversations. Organizations will bring me in. I do workshops with um, specifically, ideally, um, the men yep. uh, within an organization. And that can be challenging, right? In, in, a, in a day and age where we're talking a lot about diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, well, how do we do something just for our men? Yes. Well, it was interesting because I had, I had one organization that reached out to me and they were a little concerned about 
how it would be received. I said, well, I'll tell you what. I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go find half a dozen of your female executives. So this was all at the executive of the level, a very large organization. I said, and you tell them what we're proposing because we're proposing doing a workshop specifically for an emotional fitness boot camp for men, specifically for their male leadership. So it would be, it would exclude the women. I said, you go talk to the women in your organization at a leadership level and you ask them how they feel about that. And I'll call you in two weeks. So I called him in two weeks and he was like, Oh my God, every single one of them said, uh, yes, please. Cause you know, 98% of the challenges they had in the workplace were because a guy didn't know how to manage his emotions. Yeah. So, you know, the, the feedback was overwhelming. And, and I mean, again, I, I understand that, that you've got to be cautious how you position it. You know, this isn't about creating more dominance mm. for the men. It's about the creating a, yeah, it's exactly the opposite. It's about creating a space for the men to be vulnerable because they don't feel that they can. And it's interesting because I've worked in small groups where, you know, we've had a, a dozen men and how that comes together. But then you have a dozen men and you put one woman in the room and the dynamic just changes. Yes. There, there is this, I don't know. It, it, it feels like it's, it's biological. I mean, it's not, but you know, that there's this wiring for some kind of peacocking that happens. Um, and, and it's not a conscious thing, but it's just such a different dynamic when you get a group of guys together to drop this, the stereotypical masculine bullshit, drop the masks, drop the armor. There's a magic that happens and everyone benefits from that. I couldn't agree more. And I think um, it's, it's just incredibly important what you're doing and these conversations are critical. And men, you know, I, and I've done work in a similar area where I've seen mm. it firsthand. I've been in companies, I've been in, you know, multi-billion dollar companies where I was doing a workshop with all of the male leaders, the CEO included, we're in a room, about 10 of us in there. And these guys, you know, never talked about this, anything remotely to do with emotions, you know, they wouldn't share anything. And it took a while, but eventually the CEO shared a story about um, a pretty heavy thing that was happening in his family and with his son. And he broke down, he started crying. And almost instantly, every the whole room changed other people yeah. then started sharing their stories then the ceo ended up feeling so empowered and so much liberation from realizing that he not only could speak about it but it would help others and then he you know recorded that message sent it to the whole company it just it was crazy to see the chain reaction from literally just this one leader just yeah. showing some emotion being honest it's just crazy yeah, it, it, like I said, magic is the only word I can use to describe it because it is there is a magic that happens um, when when guys get vulnerable. It's yeah, it's it's mind boggling. Yeah, and I and I run a connected men, which is a a men's group. We meet every second Wednesday night, uh, and again, it's just about creating the space for guys to do that. Um, you know, I wrote a book I published in 2019, just before COVID called becoming a better man. When something's got to change, maybe it's you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I, so I'm, I, I, I'm a man of variety. I've got my fingers in a lot of different pies. I love it. Well, I think we have a lot in common, you know, we're both working in that sort of area and both. Yeah. I, I love variety as well and having, yeah. And I think it's, you know, very similar. So after this, I want to talk to you about how we can collaborate. Um, that's another yes, absolutely. Anyway, um, look, I, yeah, thank you again for being so open and sharing all of this. We we finish every episode with five closing questions. Um, before I go into that, just the final thing I want to ask you is, on on a personal level, um, what do you do on a daily or weekly basis to manage your own mental health and well being? Mm. So I'm a runner. So I, I run ultra marathons. I love running stupid long distances. So I've done a few hundred milers. Um, so getting out into nature is key for me. So we bought a place down in the mountains last year, uh, which is about four hours away from where I live. And, 
you know, now that COVID's up, opened up the virtual world, I spent a lot of time down there. So yeah, running in the mountains is a big one. When I'm at my best, I'm doing some form of meditation every single day. Uh, I work out like I run at least five times a week, if not six. Um, and then my men's group every two weeks, you know, I don't just host this as a clinician. Like, I mean, I, I do it for me. Yeah. So creating that space where I can open up and, and get vulnerable and it. And it's funny because my partner, Michelle, and I talk about this often, oftentimes Wednesday evening, I just, I'm drained. I don't feel like doing it. And every single time when I hop off that call with the guys, I'm just floating. And so she, we, we joke about that because last night was, a, was our men's group meeting and I did not feel like showing up. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she, she kind of joked and said, you know, you know, every time you say that and every time at the end of the, at the end of the time with the guys, you are on fire. And so, yeah, so that's a big part of it for me is just having that circle of men around me that I can confide in and that I can practice that vulnerability piece because it's a practice. Like yeah. it's, it's not easy. And, and, it, and again, even it's, it's funny because as I start to sort of lead more in this space, that part about the being a leader can't show vulnerability starts to creep back in. And it's like, dude, this yeah. is your entire freaking platform, man. So, you know, you still get trapped in it. So, so it's really just about creating those practices and journaling for me, meditation, you know, those are when I'm at my best, I'm journaling and I'm, I'm meditating every single day and I'm getting some form of exercise. So that's a big part. Well, you're obviously very disciplined, you know, to, to be able to run ultra marathons and, you know, have achieved all the stuff that you're doing. And it takes a lot of self-discipline to do that. So, um, yeah, I think that's a, another important message, but uh, yeah, it is a good reminder that, you know, and I know, you know, I can feel like that when we are, if we are working in isolation a lot, you can feel your skin crawling a bit and then you just ha have time with, you know, your male friends or have that space to open up and talk. And it's just, you, you don't, it's, it's like exactly like you said, you don't realize how much you need it until after you do it. Yes. Uh, and then you're like, holy shit, this is, you know, it's so important for all of us, you know, for yeah well it, and it is it's it's fascinating because it it can be a challenge to get guys to show up for these things yeah but you're right like once they do it's like oh my god i had no idea how badly i needed this yeah absolutely well these final questions these can be just you know whatever short sort of answers come to mind um or longer if you want but um i, I was gonna say have you met me i don't do short answers very well feel free to do long ones whatever whatever you want <laughs> But the first one is, uh, what's the best childhood memory that comes to mind for you? Oh, that's interesting. So I, I flash to ice cream in the back of dad's station wagon, driving up to somewhere in the interior of BC. So we used to we used to, yeah, we used to go camping all the time. So that would be, that would be it. I love that. And I mean, as we talked about before this podcast, a couple of weeks ago, like BC, I lived there for a, a little bit and magical place. Like it's, I think it's yes. the most beautiful place in the world. It's just, it's crazy. Stunning. Um, next question. What do you think is currently the biggest burden on mental health in society? Again, I still think there's, you know, as much as we're having the conversations, it's now how, how do we not just have the conversations, but create the space to go deep with the conversations. So I, I feel like we're, we're going wide. Now we need to go deep. Yeah. So I think that's the biggest challenge is that the, the biggest risk I see is because we're going wider, like there's more people talking about it. Mm that we start to kid ourselves into, oh yeah, we're dealing with it. Exactly. But now that we're going wider, we need to get deep. I couldn't agree more. It's sort of amazing that there's all the awareness, but at the end of the day, you know, unless we do the preventative work and, and actually embed yeah. that in society and make those changes that, you know, it won't, it won't change. It'll, it'll sort of, we'll be putting band-aids. It's still an improvement, but we won't get that sustainable yes. change. Yeah. 
what's your personal definition of happiness? Hmm. Well, I can tell you that the pla the place, the happiness for me is out running in the mountains. Yeah. Um, Freedom. It's like meditation doing that. Free, yeah, yeah, yeah it, it is. It's just happiness, contentment, being present in the moment. Yeah, I think happiness for me is being present. Yeah. And the, the places I find that easiest to do is, is out in the mountains, whether it's climbing uh, or running. And that, on a side note, yeah, I want to go climbing with you. That's right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that we need to make that happen. Um, so two more here. Uh, what are you most afraid of? Oh, that's a really good one. Clearly, you didn't prep me for these. Yeah. Um, you know, I still think... It's interesting as, as I think about that, like it, it, it's almost, there's almost a fear of vulnerability still, still as, as silly as that may sound, because outwardly there's, there's, there's definitely an appearance of vulnerability. I share a lot, but I think my biggest fear is still, which again, just comes back to how deeply ingrained this is not being able to provide the type of lifestyle that I want for my partner now and for my kids again, intellectually knowing that I don't need to do that, but there's still, yeah. there, it, it's still there. Totally. Oh, uh, we've had audio is still good. My battery just died on the camera. Oh, no problem, mate. We'll just keep going. Um, but no, totally relate to what you just said there and, and the vulnerability one, like you said earlier, it's, um, it is a, a daily process because I, I find that when, you know, you can be talking about it and then when you get more busy and have to be more of a leader, ironically, by talking about it so much, you end up becoming a bit more disconnected yourself and have to pull yourself back in and never ending process. Um, yes. So final one here. What are you most proud of? I am most proud of... I think the kids, like how well they've turned out. I am proud that I have been able to give them the infrastructure, the, the space to become the amazing little human beings that they've become. And they're not so little anymore. My son is 22. Ooh. He's six foot one and, you know, solid 225. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just, it blows my mind. And my, and my daughter's 20. So we're actually, I'm taking her climbing uh, tomorrow. Oh, amazing. So I'm, I'm super excited about that. So yeah, I'm just, I'm super proud of how they're showing up in the world. Well, I can't believe that you got your kids at that age. I mean, you look young yourself. I wouldn't have thought <laughs> <laughs> all that running Thank in you. the mountains. It, it, that's exactly what it yeah. is. <laughs> it's so true. Oh, so final thing um, for all of our listeners, if they want to learn more about you and the work you do or find your book or anything else, uh, where can we send them? Yeah, MikeCameron.ca is probably the best bet. The book Becoming a Better Man, uh, when something's got to change, maybe it's you is on Amazon or bookstores all over. But yeah, MikeCameron.ca is where you can get me. Great. Well, for everyone listening, we'll put all of the links in the show notes. So make sure to check it all out. And Mike, thank you again, mate. I um, thoroughly enjoyed talking to you and getting to know you more. And I'm sure we'll um, keep this conversation going. Uh, you know, I love everything you're doing and would love to, you know, keep talking about how we hopefully can even work together in the future. And, you know, if not, at least go climb together. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I, I am definitely down for that. Whether it's ice or rock, we'll figure, we'll figure out one or the other for sure. Exactly, exactly. Well, thank you so much, mate. My pleasure. Appreciate it. Mike provided so much valuable advice in this interview. His story emphasizes the importance of embracing vulnerability and allowing yourself to feel and process emotions, even in the face of tragedy. He encourages men to connect with their emotions as emotional connection leads to healthier and more fulfilling lives. His journey showcases the power of resilience and the ability to find growth and meaning in difficult circumstances. 
By staying present through life's challenges, we can learn and evolve, turning pain into purpose. In business and life, emotional intelligence and authentic leadership play a significant role in forming meaningful relationships. Understanding yourself and others on an emotional level fosters strong connections and success. Mike touched on all of these points. By encouraging men to be emotionally connected, he seeks to reduce suicide rates and create a more compassionate and understanding society. For aspiring entrepreneurs, Mike's journey demonstrates the value of purpose-driven entrepreneurship. Building a successful business is not just about external achievements, it involves understanding yourself and having meaningful goals. Recognizing the role of emotions in decision-making can lead to more thoughtful and empathetic choices in business and your personal life. He emphasizes the importance of moving away from setting rigid goals and instead adopting a framework based on values, intentions, and milestones. Focusing solely on achieving specific goals can lead to neglecting other important aspects of life. Finally, Mike advises that individuals should first get clear on their values before pursuing specific goals. Understanding one's core values helps in making decisions and staying aligned with personal beliefs and principles. Thank you so much to Mike Cameron for joining me today on Move Your Mind.